Anybody can do the shit they want to do when they feel like doing it. Anybody can go to the gym when they feel like going to the gym. Anybody could show up to work and give 100% when they're in the mood to do so. But what makes successful people successful is what they do when they don't feel like it. I see people writing on my page, oh, Andy, I'm motivated. Oh, I listen to your videos and I get hyped. That's great, and I'm glad that I can get you hyped for five minutes. But what do you do after the five minutes is over? What do you do after you walk out of the seminar that you paid a thousand dollars to go to? What do you do when you wake up the next day? What do you do when you have to either do what it is you know you're supposed to do without somebody there to supervise you, or you get to take the playoff because no one's going to know the difference? Those are the things that make up success. That's discipline the practice and the developing the discipline that when applied consistently can get you to the next level. If you look at the true warriors of humanity, you look at the true empire builders, you look at the true titans who are constructing a better world, they're less about pleasure seeking because they understand that if you want to have a great life, a soaring life, look at what most people do and do the opposite. Growth comes through discomfort. You look at a great athlete, it's the way they show up in the championship game is simply how they showed up in the lonely light of the early hours at practice. To have the results, only 5% of the population have. You've got to be willing to do the things that only 5% of the population are willing to do. Stop going about the day as a servant. Become the master. Run your day and stop having it run you. Believe in yourself. You got one of a hundred that has a belief. Instead of just in jaw jet talk of intent. Huge differential there. Differential somebody just believe in life. And the other one taking the most of the opportunity to be time of life. Remembrance. Otherwise, forgotten. You have no business being average, but now you justify it. You come up with these great reasons why you can't get up at five. You have these great reasons of why you have to do everything, why you don't execute, why you don't finish, why you don't follow through, why you say you don't exercise and you do it for about 10 days and you quit. You've got an excuse for why you're average. I guarantee you if you were humble enough, if you were hungry enough, if you really wanted what you said, you'd sit down and you'd study what you do and you'd say, I can do this better. But I have not exhausted all my time. I have not exhausted all my resources. There's something missing. You're not where you're supposed to be. It's not going to take a lot, but it's a small gap. And the gap is called execution. If you want to execute just a little bit more, you'll be on a whole other level. And I'm telling you, you're not where you want to be financially. You are not the person you want to be. And you have not given yourself enough credit to say, I just need to get up a half hour earlier and my whole life will change. I just need to get up one hour early. I just need to work one hour longer. Doing things that matter take time. Doing things that are great take time. Doing things that are gonna get you paid take time. You can't get around it. You can't outwork time. You can't change it. You can't do anything about it. It's just going to take time. And if you can understand aggressive patience, you can put it into play in your life, you can not only achieve everything you want to achieve, but you can do so with a sense of calm, with a sense of confidence, with a sense of certainty that your life is going to turn out the way that you want it to. It takes faith. You have to trust that things are going to happen. At the end of the day, if you go to bed at night and sleep good knowing you gave every day your all, you can feel good that things are going to happen. If you can understand that it is going to take a long time and during that time, you are going to have to do absolutely everything you can, you cannot be anything else but successful. You need structure, you need predictability, and you need more of it than you think, just to keep you sane. Now, if you're lucky, and, and maybe a bit odd, you can deviate 5% from the norm, or 10% from the norm, or something like that, 
carefully and cautiously, as long as the rest of you is all well-ordered in a normative manner. You might be able to get away with that, and you might be able to sustain it across time, and people might be able to tolerate you if you do it, or maybe you'll get really lucky and you happen to be creative, but reasonably well put together, and people will actually be happy that there's something idiosyncratic and unique about you. But even under those circumstances, mostly what you want is to have a routine that's disciplined, that's predictable, and bloody well stick to it. You're going to be way healthier and happier and saner if you do that. And then the other thing that you need, because this is one of the things the psychoanalysts got wrong, I think, is that they overestimated the degree to which sanity was a consequence of internal, of being properly structured internally, you know? Because from the psychoanalytic point of view, you're sort of an ego, and that ego is inside you. And of course, it rests on an unconscious structure. But the purpose of psychoanalysis is to sort out that unconscious structure and the ego on top of it, and to make you a fully functioning and autonomous individual. But there's a problem with that, because the reason that you're sane as a fully functional and autonomous human being isn't because you've organized your psyche, even though that's important. The reason that you're sane if, you're a we if you have a well-organized unconscious and ego is because other people can tolerate having you around for reasonably extensive periods of time and will cuff you across the back of the head every time you do something so stupid that people will dislike you permanently if you continue. And so what people are doing to each other all the time, just non-stop, is broadcasting sanity signals back and forth, right? It's like you smile at people if they're well, if they're not, not only behaving properly, but behaving in a way that you would like to see them continue to behave, you frown at them if they're not, you ignore them if they're not, you shun them, you, you roll your eyes at them, you manifest a disgust face, you don't listen to them, you interrupt them, you won't cooperate with them, you won't compete with them. It's like you're blasting signals at other people about how to regulate their behavior so frequently, well, it just makes up all of your social interaction. That's why we face each other and we have emotional displays on our face and we're looking at each other's eyes and we know exactly, we know as much as we can about what's going on with each other given that we don't have immediate access to the contents of their consciousness. And so partly what you're doing with your routine is establishing yourself as a credible, reliable, trustworthy, potentially interesting human being who isn't going to do anything too erratic at any moment. And everyone else is around there tapping you into shape, making sure that that's exactly what you are. And that's how you stay sane. And so what happens to people too, if they don't have a routine and they get isolated is they start to drift. And they drift badly because the world is too complicated for you to keep it organized all by yourself. You just cannot do it. So a lot of our, so we outsource the problem of sanity. And it's very intelligent that we outsource the problem of sanity because Sanity is an impossibly complex problem. And so the way that we manage the incredibly complex problem is we have a very large number of brains working simultaneously on the problem all the time. It's like a stock market for sanity. And it's partly, and I use that, I use that definition with purpose because the stock market does the same kind of impossible thing, right? Because it tries to price things, which is impossible. There's, how many things are there? Like a billion. How in the world do you decide what the price is? You can't decide what the price is. That's why you have a stock market. As well, in a free market, I mean for, for consumer goods, is everyone's voting on what the price of everything is all the time. And that's the way we figured out because it's actually, it's technically impossible. Understand, your mind is weaker than your emotions, but you become aware of this weakness only in moments of adversity precisely the time when you need strength. What best equips you to cope with the heat of battle is neither more knowledge nor more intellect. What makes your mind stronger and more able to control your emotions is internal discipline and toughness. No one can teach you this skill. You cannot learn it by reading about it. Like any discipline, it can come only through practice, experience, even a little suffering. An active life serves the purpose of giving man the opportunity to realize values in creative work, while a passive life of enjoyment affords him the opportunity to obtain fulfillment in experiencing beauty, art, or nature.
But there is also purpose in that life, which is almost barren of both creation and enjoyment, and which admits of but one possibility of high moral behavior, namely in man's attitude to his existence, an existence restricted by external forces. A creative life and a life of enjoyment are banned to him. But not only creativeness and enjoyment are meaningful. If there is a meaning in life at all, then there must be a meaning in suffering. Suffering is an ineradicable part of life, even as fate and death. Without suffering and death, human life cannot be complete. As his mind becomes purer and his emotions come under control, his thoughts become clearer and his instincts truer. As he learns to live more and more in harmony with his higher self, his body's natural intuition becomes active of itself. The result is that false desires and unnatural instincts, which have been imposed upon it by others or by himself, will become weaker and weaker and fall away entirely in time. This may happen without any attempt to undergo an elaborate system of self-discipline on his part. Yet it will affect his way of living, his diet, his habits. False cravings like the craving for smoking tobacco will vanish of their own accord. False appetites like the appetite for alcoholic liquor or flesh food will likewise vanish. But the more deep-seated the desire, the longer it will take to uproot it except in the case of some who will hear and answer a heroic call for an abrupt change. Persistence and variety. These are the two primary ways to develop great ideas or to solve important problems. Keep leaning your head against a topic for a long time, certainly for weeks, possibly for years, and along the way, try many lines of attack. Continue to generate options, Explore paths and propose silly ideas. Copy and paste concepts from widely different disciplines and see if it gets you anywhere. All of the while, continue to refine the best solution you've found thus far. What looks like genius may simply be the byproduct of persistence and variety. The tendency to avoid challenges is so omnipresent human beings that it can properly be considered a characteristic of human nature. But calling it natural does not mean it is essential or beneficial or unchangeable behavior. It is also natural to defecate in our pants and never brush our teeth. Yet we teach ourselves to do the unnatural until the unnatural becomes itself second nature. Indeed, all self-discipline might be defined as teaching ourselves to do the unnatural Another characteristic of human nature, perhaps the one that makes us most human, is our capacity to do the unnatural, to transcend and hence transform our own nature.